Well, good morning to my brothers and sisters from the chapel. You guys well? So 12 of you are doing well. <laughs> I'm really blessed to be with you. As he said, I'm Tim Millsaps, and I have the privilege of serving at Calvary Chapel Chattanooga. I serve primarily in men's ministry and counseling and what we call a Calvary Care, which is basically pastoral care for people. And so I'm really blessed to do that. And, and I've had the privilege uh, for about a year and a half of coming alongside your pastor and getting to know him and watch him grow in the Word and as a man. And, and it's just been a blessing. He, he journeyed with uh, the church I was at before and has come down and filled in for me when I was out of town. And so he's really an amazing Bible teacher. And so I'm really humbled to have been asked to fill in for him in his pulpit and uh, you know, throughout the years, I, I want you to understand something you may not be aware of, that throughout the years, 20 years of serving in, a, in Calvary Chapel, I've watched and helped, assisted many, many Calvary Chapel church plants, and I've, I've walked with fellas through their church plant season, and I, I want you to understand how unique a work that the Lord is doing here up in uh, Cleveland. It's exciting to see what God is doing, both not just, not just numerically, but kind of behind the scenes. And, you know, this morning having the privilege to pray with the volunteers. And most Calvary chapels, I know there's a lot of really, really big ones, but the average church size in America is about 70 people, including children and visiting dogs and cats and anybody else you can count, right? Calvary chapels are no different. 70 to 100 people is about the average size and so when I'm talking to 50 volunteers this morning, volunteers this morning, knowing that that's behind the scenes serving you, and it's interesting to me because God doesn't do something like that unless he's preparing you guys for something for this city. You know, don't ever believe if someone says Cleveland doesn't need another church. Cleveland needs another church. That's why the Lord brought you here, right? Right? And so I'm, I'm just really excited to, to just see what God is doing. And so to, to go ahead and use a Pastor Richie phrase, God is working. You know what I'm saying, y'all? Right? <laughs> so how about I pray before we get started? Lord, um, we just want to thank you so much for uh, Pastor Richie and his sweet wife and the kids. And, you know, even as uh, uh, Jeff said, just that they get a chance to be away and chase their kids and have some time with you and refresh. And, but Lord, we also want to thank you for what's going on here this morning, that there's people that have come here to hear the word, to worship you, to take a break from life and kind of recharge. And then going out from here into a city that you have deemed it necessary to plant another branch, if you will, of your church. Different, for sure, in many ways. Uh, unique, absolutely. But Lord, call to Cleveland for a purpose and a reason that probably, most likely, we're not even really completely aware of. And maybe this side of heaven, we, we just won't know the impact of this pebble that has been dropped into the pond of Cleveland, Tennessee. But we're thankful to be a part and to see your hand work. And so I pray for these individuals that are here today. In particular, you brought them here for a reason, to hear this particular point from your text of Scripture. And so would you, by the divine work of your Holy Spirit is only you can do. Will you open our spiritual minds to hear the spiritual truths of the word that can govern and control the fleshly thoughts that we have that fight so hard to take control of our lives? Restore us, redeem us, bless us by your word in Jesus' name. It's, we say amen. So it's, it's been repeated far too often for really any one person to claim the original authenticity of it. But there is a phrase that rolls off the tongues of visionaries and leaders and politicians, pastors, and social activists. It's a repeated phrase that you, I know you've heard. It's so simple, it's so true, and perhaps it's uniquely acquirable, so uniquely acquirable, that those who seek to inspire others, you can't help but stumble upon it or really call upon some deep down subconscious memory planted there by someone who once inspired them with the same phrase, and that phrase is just simply this, a pebble in the pond. 
A pebble in the pond, the the picture drawn that you just drop a little pebble and it begins to ripple and we really don't know how far the ripple's going to go. And though it may even seem to disseminate down to the point that you can't see the movement in the water anymore, that's still below the surface, that pebble dropped into the pond is having an impact somewhere. And there's dozens, if not hundreds of organizations who use this word picture to portray the one single action... One single action acted upon by one perfectly placed, willing soul can have an impact in such a far-reaching way that, that this individual, whoever it is that, gets, that makes the ripple, that they may not in, even be aware of the final resting place of his or her splash. Now, one such individual who unwittingly made one such choice that has echoed down through 2,800 years of history to change your eternal destiny, to give you the opportunity to know freedom from sin, love of family, friends, and most importantly, a relationship with God. You may not even know her name, some of you may have read through the, the, the cursory read through the scriptures in your one year Bible app and you came across her name, you came across the story and you just kind of moved on by it without realizing that without her contribution, without her pebble in the pond, you would not even have had an opportunity to get saved. You would have no choice to know God. And yet we probably don't know her name. You see, a pebble in the pond is that. It's just simply that. It's a choice with consequences far beyond one's own imagination, but not beyond their action. So her name, as I draw your attention to her, her name is Jehoshaphat. She lived 2,800 years ago, about 800 years before Jesus was born. She came from the royal line of King David. And she came down when when God had made the promise that the Messiah would come through the line of King David. It came down in the point in history to where all all of the descendants had dwindled down to one child. One child remaining alive that could carry the line. And you need to understand that God had promised that he would send his Savior, the Messiah, to the world specifically through the line of David. Had Satan achieved his plan and killed all of David's descendants, we would have had no hope of ever being saved from our sin. And he came within one little baby's heartbeats. If he had just stopped the one child from seeing adulthood, we would be dead in our sins today. Here's why. Because if even one of God's promises, just one part of his plan were to fail, we would have all remained in bondage to our sin, for it would have proven that God was unable to fulfill his word. If only one aspect, one minuscule truth, he couldn't have just, well, I'll just use someone else, because to choose to use someone else would have alleviated all the promises that he had made for the line to come through David. So he would have proven that he was not able to keep his word. And isn't that really where it all began anyway? I mean, isn't that where Satan began to question everything, to to cast his own pebble in the pond, to make his ripple in the mind of Eve and hence in in the thoughts and actions of Adam? When he said this, you remember he said, Hath God said? So he began to question the very word of God, God's ability to keep his promise. Now, Jehoshaphat, she was the sister of King Ahaziah of Judah, and she was the wife of Jehoiada, the priest. Now, as with most pastor's wives, they often turn out to be much braver than their husband. And when King Ahaziah died, his mother made herself the queen. And then to secure her throne, she had every single member of the royal family and anyone who could possibly lay claim to the throne, she had them put to death. 
And like some of the kind of the greatest adventure stories in history, this one is an epic one in comparison. Because at great risk to her own life, Jehoshaphat stepped up and she stole away her nephew, Joash, the sole surviving child. She stole him and hid him, only a baby at the time. So at great personal risk to her and all of her family, she put herself at risk to save this one child. So she, along with her husband, Jehoiada, and Joash's nurse, they hid him in the temple for just about six years until his seventh birthday. And I want to read you the rest of the story. If you will turn in 2 Kings chapter 11. 2 Kings chapter 11. And we're going to pick it up in verse 1. When Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, 11.1, she arose and destroyed all the royal heirs. But Jehoshaphat, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were being murdered. And they hid him and his nurse in the bedroom from Athaliah so that he was not killed. So he was hidden with her in the house of the Lord for six years while Athaliah reigned over the land. And in the seventh year, Jehoiada sent and brought the captains of hundreds of the bodyguards and the escorts, brought them into the house of the Lord to him. And he made a covenant with them and took an oath from them in the house of the Lord and showed them the king's son. And he commanded them saying, this is what you shall do. One third of you who come on duty on the Sabbath shall be keeping watch over the king's house. One third shall be at the gate of Seur, and one third at the gate behind the escorts. You shall keep the watch of the house, lest it be broken down. The two contingents of you who go off duty on the Sabbath shall keep the watch of the house of the Lord of the King for the king, but you shall surround the king on all sides. Every man with his weapon in his hand, and whoever comes within range, let him be put to death. You are to be with the king as he goes out and as he comes in. So the captains of the hundreds did according to all that Jehoiada the priest commanded. Each of them took his men who were to be on duty on the Sabbath with those who were going off duty on the Sabbath and came to Jehoiada the priest. And the priest gave the captains of hundreds the spears and shields which had belonged to the King David that were in the temple of the Lord. And then the escorts stood, every man with his weapons in his hand, all around the king from the right side of the temple to the left side of the temple, by the altar and by the house. And he brought out the king's son, put the crown on him, and gave him the testimony. They made him king and anointed him. And they clapped their hands and said, Long live the king. Now when Athaliah heard the noise of the escorts and the people, she came to the people in the temple of the Lord. And when she looked, there was the king standing by a pillar according to custom. And the leaders and the trumpeters were by the king, and all the people of the land were rejoicing and blowing trumpets. So Athaliah tore her clothes and cried out, treason, treason. And Jehoiada the priest commanded the captains of the hundreds, the officers of the army, and said to them, take her outside under guard and slay her with a sword and whoever follows her. For the priest had said, do not let her be killed in the house of the Lord. So they seized her and she went by the way of the horse's entrance into the king's house and there she was killed. Had Jehoshaphat not rescued her nephew from Athaliah, the line of David to Jesus would have been broken and God's promises voided. So why do I tell you this story as we begin our journey today? Because this morning I want to share her story as a backdrop. I give it to you as a build-in to the real point of the message. I give you this backstory because of its relation to what is taking place during the years that Joel begins to prophesy. This is what he's walking into. The opening chapter, if you want to turn there to the book of Joel, the opening chapter of Joel speaks of the destruction that the nation had endured under Queen Athaliah. And in a very real way, her rule, church, listen, this is going to resonate in the culture we live in today. In a very real way, her rule was God's judgment upon his very own people. You see, God often doesn't give us the leaders that we desire. He gives us the leaders that we deserve. With that in mind, I want you to read with me the book of Joel, chapter 1, and we'll pick it up. We'll begin in verse 1. 
the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders, and give ear all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened to your days? Or even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children about it. Tell your children's children. Tell their children and their children another generation. What the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. What the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. Now the text is actually, just to bring a little clarity, the text is actually a literal swarm of locusts. And it's a picture of the utter draining and complete consumption of anything of virtue in all of the land of Israel during the years of Queen Athaliah. Athaliah was, uh, was in the line of Omri and of Ahab, two kings who led the Jews into the worship of false gods and into specifically the heinous act of the sacrificing of their own children as they would take their children and lay them upon the bronze altars in the midst of the day and watch them die as the heat of the sun would, like an oven, cook those children. But it meant nothing to them if it could be exchanged for a perceived favor with the gods to ease the parents' life. You see, in short, the people chose to live for their own sensual pleasures. And they killed their own babies and because they found God to be a nuisance, His requirements and His laws to be a burden. As they chased after other gods and they sacrificed their kids. And as a result of that, God gave them the leaders that they deserved. Now, I don't want you to miss something very important. Joel is speaking into this particular culture and climate. And I believe he's speaking to us today into our culture and climate. Where a child is so undervalued, Joel tells the Jews this. He tells them to tell this prophecy to their kids and to their grandkids and so on and so on. And that's why one of the reasons if you are here at Calvary Chapel or if you've been a part of many Calvary chapels, we at Calvary chapels, we love kids. We love teaching our children the word. Calvary chapels want kids to learn the word, not just to learn the discipline of sitting in church. We want them to learn the word. It's important to us that we offer a strong and a fun and a safe children's ministry. But listen, we are not responsible for your child's growth and biblical knowledge. You are. There is a lie that goes around the world, and it goes like this it takes a village to raise a child. Bull loney. It takes a village to mess up a child. It takes parents, it takes parenting, a mom and a dad to raise a child. Now, for those of you that find yourself as a single parent, praise the Lord that you're the bride of Christ and you've got some help and his name is Jesus and he'll help you. But his ideal plan for us is that we would raise, not just live in the proximity of our children and trust that their spiritual growth is gonna come from church, but that we, like Joel is telling us, would tell them of the stories and of what God has done in our lives and he's doing and wants to do in their lives. Now, we're only a small part as a church, a small piece of the larger puzzle. And I've been blessed throughout the years to, to have come in, in contact with so many parents who have committed to really teach their kids simple Bible stories. You know, the first time I taught the book of Revelation, I wanted to teach Revelation and I remember that Pastor Chuck used to say, listen, when, if you want to be a Bible teacher, you got to sign up for a couple years of teaching third graders. If you can teach a third grader, then you can teach the adults because third graders are just a step above most congregations in their ability to learn, right? Can I get an amen, right? You guys, have, have you ever done well and I'm smarter than a fifth grader? I'm like a third grade level, set, you know, second grade level. But, but I love the concept. So I decided that I would teach the book of Revelation to my third grade son. And so him and I went through Revelation together. He doesn't, like to this day, he doesn't remember pretty much what I taught him, which that's pretty much how it is with the congregations I've taught too. But, uh, but, but, none, but he does remember us doing it, you know, just having that time together to go through, through the word. My wife has shared with me so many times about throughout the years, just time and time again, parents that are taking the time to contribute to their children's growth. Don't do that. 
The Bible is a fascinating group of books, you guys. If you try just a little bit, your kids will love it a lot. But I got to admit, and I have to admit, when you get to stories like the one that we're reading now, it's a little bit scary to pass on to the children. But God thought it was necessary. So let's do that. Now, the locusts that came up, I want to talk to you about them. The locusts that came up were sent to pick clean any vestige of prosperity that they retained under the horrific rule of the two kings and this wicked queen. When the locusts come, they come in mass numbers and they completely consume everything edible in their path and it's complete and utter destruction. Now we in America, we kind of divorce ourselves from locust plagues. We don't think about a giant locust plague coming through our area. I think probably most of us, the worst we'll see is, what are they, katydids or something? When you get the, is that what they're called? They come every seven years or something. They're kind of everywhere. It's, that, that's probably the closest we get. But listen, the worst plague in recorded history, worldwide, globally recorded history, took place right here in the United States in 1875. You can look it up. Devastating locust plagues globally can reach into the billions. The worst ones recorded will have about 100 billion locusts. But in 1875, the Rocky Mountain locust, locust plague, it devastated Kansas, Nebraska, Colorado, and western Missouri. And it was over two, <laughs> 200,000 square miles covered at one time in locusts. Not like swarming through, but... At one time, a mass locust of 200,000 square miles of locusts consumed those states. If you stood and you watched them pass overhead, it took five days for the swarm to go past you. And based on the density, the square miles covered simultaneously, they estimated that there were well into four or five trillion locusts. Can I say that again? Four or five t -t -t trillion. We don't get trillion. We don't understand. Our government doesn't understand trillion, <laughs> right? That's just a word to them. We don't get trillion. For Pete's stinking sake, that's incredible. Listen, they, st they were trying to combat these things with mat. They literally would light forests on fire to try to kill them. But the swarm was so dense that it smothered the fire. It put out any attempt to, to start a fire. And here, here's, the, here's the thing. The point of Joel's prophecy is to show that God is going to leave nothing from their rebellion. And so Joel describes, he could have just listed locusts, but there's four distinct Hebrew words given for each of these individual locusts. And each one means something very, very specific. So the first one that he tells us about is what's called a chewing locust. Now, is anybody getting the heebie-jeebies about right now? You're starting to itch and scratch, right? All four of these descriptors, the, the chewing, the swarming, the crawling, and the consuming, they're types or stages of locusts, if you will. Now, the chewing locust in the Hebrew is the gazam. The gazam. It's basically the palmer worm. And it's a locust that's in its caterpillar stage, okay? It's different than the other ones. So this is the locust in its caterpillar stage. And here's the picture that it gives to us. Sin, as in the sin that has taken over Israel, it begins slowly, moving like a caterpillar, just consuming little bits here and there, taking over more and more, not flying in your face in mass, this fearful cloud, you wake up one day, didn't know where it come from, it just blindsided you, no, this thing crawls along, you can see it, you can stop it, it's not that hard to stop, it just keeps coming, but you let it live and let it consume. Cultural decay, personal sin, the destruction of a nation from within is always a slow process. Evil eats away at what is good, and then it builds a cocoon. It kind of settles in, and we become comfortable, and then it begins to transform it, slowly chewing away at what is right. I've seen it in marriages. I've seen it in individual lives. It's, I can see the thing coming. The people I'm talking to can see the thing coming, but they still choose to allow it to draw in, letting it eat away because they think I'm okay. I've got plenty of resource. I can deal with this until pretty soon your capacity to fight it is gone. 
The second one is the swarming locust. Now, the swarming locust in the Hebrew is the word arbe, arbe, and it means mass swarm. This is more of a, of a stage than it is a bug. And once these things kind of sprout and get their wings and they begin to move in mass, now it's not this slowly creeping thing. Now it's like a raging fire that will eat all the vegetation. And whether Joel meant this to be to represent a progression or not, it is most certainly clear that it is a progression. Because sin, especially national sins, seem to take decades to build, and then all of a sudden, they just grow exponentially. Don't we see that happening now? It's like the ludicrous, the ridiculousness of what we're approving, and what laws we're changing, and what we're calling normal. It's like, are you kidding me? I mean, are you kidding me? There was a, I just heard that in Canada, the first child was born where the parents fought the right and said, we don't... Listen, we cannot assign a gender to the child because it's violating their rights. The ludicrousness of what we're dealing with right now as a culture is as, listen, we let the worm eat away until now it's like storming in upon us. Crawling locusts, a crawling locust. The crawling locust is the word yalek. It's the Hebrew word yalek, and it's the canker worm. This, the canker worm is a juice eater. It's, it's not just a vegetation eater, but it actually sucks the juice from the plant. This locust swarm is known to eat all of the vegetation and then begin to, to chew on the stalks and the branches until the, the branch will break. And then once the branch breaks, they climb up on that little break and they begin to suck the life out of the branch. They begin to eat the vegetation, the life-giving uh, a sap that would keep the plant alive. The canker worm will destroy the life of the plant, and the, li- and the plant may eventually die off. Isn't it true with sin? If sin is not dealt with, it just eats away and eats away until it breaks us. And then when it breaks us, it begins finally and ultimately to bring about death, the inability to recover, to ever get life again. James chapter 1, look at James chapter 1, verse 14, James 1, 14. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, it brings forth death. You see, sin left alone will not stop or be satisfied until it finishes in death. It may literally be the ending of a life, as we've seen with our loved ones. But it can most certainly be the death of a marriage the death of a dream or a career. And as I've been close to brothers, I've seen it be the death of a ministry as they allow sin to just break them and then suck the life out of them until they're ultimately just dead. Like the canker worm, it'll break you. It'll take the life from you to the point that if unchecked and unrepented of and unconfessed, It'll take you to the point you'll never return. And the last one is the consuming locust. This is the cassel. The cassel. This is just a caterpillar. It doesn't change into something else. It's a caterpillar. This is the final blow. This is, this, there's no coming back when this creature begins to consume a plant. They'll literally strip the bark and the skin from any tree or plant. And when these locusts are gone, it, looks, it literally looks like a fire has gone through and consumed and burned everything. They leave the trees burned white and the ground utterly, completely barren, no vegetation. These are the four stages. And I think each of us, as we can look at it, can see the stages of sin as a nation and as individuals and culturally. Let's read on. Joel chapter 1, verse 5. Awake, you drunkards, and weep and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it has been cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. His teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has the fangs of a fierce lion. He's laid waste my vine and ruined my fig tree, and has stripped it bare and thrown it away. Its branches are made white. Though there would literally be plagues of locusts that would come into the culture there, the plague is also this picture of an army. 
that is coming afterward. And he says, listen, you guys are drunk with your sin. And God says, wake up and open your eyes. Look around you and see. I'm not trying to withhold from you blessing. I want you to wake up to what is coming. And then he tells them what's coming. Verse 8. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering have been cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn who minister to the Lord. The field is wasted. The land mourns for the grain is ruined. The new wine is dried up. The oil fails. Be ashamed, you farmers. Wail, you vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley because the harvest of the field has perished. The vine is dried up and the fig tree is withered and the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also. The apple tree and the trees of the field are withered. Surely joy has withered away from the sons of men. Joel saw, Joel's basically saying this, gang, it is time to take it seriously. You cannot put your head in the sand. He goes on to say, listen, even the land around you is trying to tell you something. It's mourning. He said, look, look, at, look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Romans 8, verse 18. God speaks to this again in the New Testament. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. You see, Adam didn't just bring sin upon mankind. He brought it upon all of nature. That, that kind of just pops my cookies a little bit when I think about the reality that I'm an outdoors guy. I love creation. If you've ever gone hiking or camped or kayaked or fished or been outside on a fall afternoon and smelled or smelled the flowers of spring, if you've ever gazed up at Half Dome or watched stunned at any of the amazing creatures that we see videotaped on the incredible Discovery Channel shows of Mother Nature, you have to admit that what we just read is radical. Why? Because can we not, would you agree, just, isn't it amazing creation? I mean, come on, guys, there is a fish on the bottom of the sea with a light bulb on his head, <laughs> right, to draw other fish so he can eat them. I mean, that part of God in his creation proves that God has a teenage heart because only teenage boys create creatures with light bulbs to draw you in and eat you, <laughs> right? But I mean, I just look, I'm fascinated by it. But listen, in all of its beauty, its intricity, the incredible vastness of space, the, the, the delicate balance of the, of the microscopic world and all of that, listen, it's still broken. It's broken. When you see a snow-capped Mount Everest and all its beauty, that's broken compared to what it's supposed to be. That, that just, that's amazing to me to what it should have been and what it will one day be as God recreates, so to speak, makes all things new. But sin has devastated all of it. And that's what Joel's warning these people about. And I have a few final thoughts because I want to leave you with hope. Verse 13. Gird yourselves and lament, you priests. Wail, you ministers, before the altar. Come lie all night in sackcloth, you who minister to my God, for the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God, and cry out to the Lord. Joel very specifically and powerfully lays out a five-point plan to set 
things right. See, it's not a doom and gloom message. It's about this is what's wrong. Let's face it. We all know it's what's wrong. How do we make it right? So here's your plan. He gives you five things. If you'll do this, if you as a culture or you individually or right now maybe your marriage is struggling or you're struggling personally, one of the things as a pastor that's palpably powerful to me is when I stand in front of hundreds of people having counseled literally thousands throughout the years, I promise you within a few feet of you, people that you don't know have gone through things in life that I don't know why they're here. Why they're not sitting in a corner, sucking their thumb, rocking back and forth in misery because of the things that those who love them have done to them. Or even those of you, there's many that are sitting within arms. If you could spin a circle all around you, your arm is going to touch somebody that's making choices that they would be ashamed and embarrassed of for all to know. And those sin choices are leading them down a path of potential destruction in their lives. But this is what's so cool. You don't have to go that way. There is a gospel truth. There, is, there are five things we can employ in our lives to bring ourselves into a place of health. Five things. Joel gives us this plan. If our life as a nation is being eaten away by sin, or we privately uh, are being eaten away by sin, this is the path to healing. Number one, if you're a note taker, it's very simple. Fast. Just fast. Make this such a priority that even eating is not Im- as important by comparison. <laughs> Who likes to eat? Who likes to fast? Fast is the best word about fast is the word itself. If you're going to fast, do it fast, right? (laughs) Just get it over. Lord, I'm going to fast breakfast today. I'll see you at lunch, you know, right? So, but hey, listen, many say fasting is not a New Testament principle. I just simply say, okay, that's fine. I'm not going to argue. Keep struggling in your sins then and keep the secret and and whatever. You try to get over it. But if you... You want to employ a very powerful truth? Fasting is a powerful tool against the powerful urges of your flesh. In the book of Acts chapter, and I'm just going to give these to you. You can write them down and read them later. In Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, the apostles fasted and prayed for direction. You need direction? Deny your flesh for a while. In Acts chapter 14, verses 21 to 23, they fasted for encouragement and strength. How many guys could use some encouragement once in a while? Fast. Deny your flesh a little bit. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. They, you fast to improve your marriage or for your family. Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. That's a pretty New Testament principle when it's about Jesus, right? In the book of Matthew, it's even in the red letters, right? Jesus fasted for 40 days and he called upon the word. People ask me all the time, well, what, how does fasting work? Let me, let me just, I'm going to give you the simplest, this is, this is the third grade lesson I taught, I taught my kids, I, this is it for me, listen. I ask you before, I'm asking again, who likes to eat? Who likes to eat? So, the rest of you didn't raise your hand, you're probably too hungry right now to raise your hand. You're tired, you're ready to go eat, right? Here's what fasting does. When you want to pray for something and you're denying your flesh, Have you noticed if you've ever fasted that the moment you choose to fast, suddenly you're always thinking about eating, right? So here's what what happens. If I want to remember to pray for my kids, I'll remember to pray for them, you know. But if I'm fasting, every time I'm, why am I hungry? Oh, I'm fasting. Okay, I want to pray for my kids, right? So I love that God said deny yourself food because if you deny yourself food, you're going to think about what you're praying about all the time. And so you'll, you'll pray more. And I just think that's a very practical and real truth. And God knows we love to eat. What, what's the one thing he told us to remember and buy? Communion, right? You got to eat, eating something. When we get to heaven, what's the first thing we're going to do? We're going to have a marriage supper of the lamb, right? There's going to be tacos and <laughs> dessert. and mm, Love it. <laughs> Secondly, note takers, ready? Fellowship. Fellowship. He says, gather an assembly. The devil loves lone sheep that are wounded and hurt or struggling. The worst thing that you can do with your sin is to keep it to yourself. James chapter 5 verse 16 tells us that if we confess our faults to one another so that we would be healed. It's not that God 
forgives us when we confess to each other, but there's something about bringing in other people confession that brings a sense of healing. In many cases, it's because when you confess, someone can put their arm around you, weep with you, comfort you. I've been there. I can walk with you through it. Fellowship, if you don't have a, a culture of people that you're drawing close to, you're setting yourself up for more sin to permeate your life. There's so much more power in sharing with others what you struggle with. Don't go it alone. It's dangerous. Third, this is great. Go see a pastor. Go see a pastor. Now, I say pastor, but this speaks to any church leader that you respect. I hope that you as individuals are or at least have mentors in your life. People you can go to that are ahead, down the road from you spiritually, that you can go to. You're losing out if you don't put someone, seek out someone to plant in your life just ahead of you in the journey. And you should, in fact, be someone who's got someone behind you that can look up to you so that you can be a mentor to them. Let us pray for you and anoint you and stand in the gap for you. That's why God has given us spiritual leadership. Fourth, go to church. Go to church, that's what he says. Don't just hang out with Christians. Attend a church service. Be in worship, prayer, teaching. Put yourself in the proximity of the house of the Lord. It's not good enough to just say, well, I have Christian friends, but I like church to me is out there on the weekends somewhere. No, put yourself in a church family so that you can serve and be a part and grow and see God do something great. And then fourth, to me, the most important one, he says this. He says, and then cry out to the Lord. Are you in a place where your life, your sin, the culture is just completely destroying you? The canker worm, the locust, they've just eaten up your life. Your sin is destroying you. Listen, you can cry out to the Lord. He's not tired of hearing it. This is the most important one. Psalm 18 says six. In my distress, Psalm 18, six. In my distress, I called out unto the Lord. And I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. Psalm 34, verse 17, the righteous cry out to the Lord, and he hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, I love this, Luke chapter 4, 18 and 19. I want to read it to you, because this is what Jesus said he came to do. Why do we think that he came to do this just for those who aren't Christians yet? And then when we become Christians, we think there's no grace for us anymore. There's no room for us if we've gone so far and the canker worm and the, 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 the uh, locust has eaten up our lives. And we, we, we're, churches are, are, the saying goes along, church is the only organization that ends up shooting their wounded. Right? You come as a Christian and you're wounded, we just kill you. Cast you out. You've ruined, you, you don't have place anymore. Oh, if you walk in the doors and we don't know anything about you and you're a sinner, we, we praise the Lord, you're going to repent, we want to receive you. But when a, a Christian or especially a Christian leader falls, we just drive the bus over him. It's terrible. We should be ashamed because our Lord came to do this. I love it. I already read to you. It says, and the righteous cry out in their distress and the Lord hears. Listen to this. Luke 4. I love it. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book. I love it. That's what he came to do. He's never stopped doing that. He wants to deliver us today. The word tells us he wants to heal you today. He wants to settle your heart today. And this morning, listen, you have a chance. You weren't brought here because it was a nice day and this is where you want to come to church. You don't come to, the, to, the, to Jesus unless the Father is drawing you. That's what the Spirit tells us, what Jesus said. You wouldn't even be here if God wasn't drawing you because he loves you so much. You have a chance to cast a pebble in the pond, to make a choice that will echo down through the generations that follow if Jesus doesn't return this year. But if, so if you'll fast and you'll fellowship and you'll seek counsel, you immerse yourself in the church, and you cry out to the Lord, it all starts with that choice. With those choices, God can begin to rebuild what the canker worm and the locust and the caterpillar has eaten. Listen, if you, you, you are heaven bound if you're a Christian. That's certainly our eternal destination. And don't let the devil come along and confuse you by all of the different uh, messages and confusing beliefs and practices. A decision of faith in Jesus and a life abiding in Christ has a destination and it's fellowship with God for eternity. I, I, gotta, I, wanna, I, want, I gotta tell you this little story just because I like it. 
This couple from Wisconsin, they decided to go to Florida to thaw out during a particularly icy winter. So they planned to stay at the same hotel where they had spent their honeymoon over 20 years earlier. Because of their hectic schedules, it was difficult to coordinate the flights, so the husband left Wisconsin and flew to Florida on Thursday. But his wife waited at home to fly down to Florida and join him the next day on Friday. So when the husband gets to the hotel, he checks in, and it had been remodeled. It was now a modernized hotel, and he found that they actually had a computer with wireless internet service, and it was available in their room. He's super excited, so he shoots out an email to his wife right away. He accidentally, he left out one letter in her email address. But it just so happened that that email was still a valid email address. So it went out. It went out to someone else. Now, somewhere in Houston, a widow had just returned home from her husband's funeral. He was a particularly mean fella who had not treated her very well throughout their marriage. So the widow decided to check her email expecting comforting messages from their friends and relatives. (laughs) After reading the first message, she screamed and fainted. The widow's son came running into the room, found his mother fainted, picked her up, brought her, kind of resuscitated her. But he read this on the computer screen. To my loving wife. From your loving husband. Subject, I've arrived, sweetheart. The flight down here was a bit rough, and I know you're surprised to hear from me. They have computers here now, and and you're allowed to send emails from your room. I just arrived, and I've been checked in. I see that everything has been prepared for your arrival tomorrow. (laughs) I'm looking forward to seeing you then. P.S. It sure is hot down here. (laughs) Listen, we, we don't need to fear that we've somehow got it wrong. We haven't got it wrong. Why make the journey so hard? Live your life so that the ripple that you leave behind is not ambiguous, but it's clear. And it's a clear way for others to see clearly how to get to heaven safely and with abundant joy. Live in such a way that your journey is a joy and the And the world may be changed because Jesus dropped you into the center of your relationships. Maybe that's one of the reasons why the devil works so hard to get us as Christians wrapped up and compromising in our sin. Because when we do, we're not making the right ripple. We're not impacting those around us for eternity. I told you earlier, Cleveland needed another church, and that's why God dropped the chapel into her borders, to be a pebble in the pond, to make disciples who will carry the message of the truth into a very confused culture. It's a blessing to be with you guys today, but I hope that if you're here, the gospel is always and still is the good news of Jesus. And there's a chance that you've allowed something to creep in, a belief system, a practice that is the antithesis of the truth of the word, and you've grown comfortable with it. But if you'll begin today as a Christian, listen, the gospel is still there for you. You can begin to employ those five principles and watch the power of the cross restore you. But if you've been, you came here today and you're seeking God, you haven't yet made a decision to give your life to Jesus. I'm here to tell you, I gave my life to him when I was 12 years old, so that was like 20 years ago. And he's never, ever failed me. 
He didn't just give me eternal life. He's given me life right now. The gospel's for you, but you got to ask him to forgive your sin. You got to, the Bible tells us if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. So we're going to go out with a worship song. When service is over, listen, there'll be some of us up here to pray with you. If you need to just, as I shared with you, come and see a pastor or a church leader. Let us pray with you. We'd love to do that. But if you want to give your life to Jesus, he brought you here today. He knows all the stuff. He wants to save you from what's coming. I hope you'll come and let us pray with you. Father, I want to thank you for our time today with this precious church, for these truths that are eternal. Pray that you're the power of your spirit would now take the word of God, take it past the junk of our souls and our hearts and lead us into a place that we're open and pliable and that you would would take this church, these disciples, and you would make them disciple makers. And Lord, if you don't come back for the next 10 years, that in 10 years the footprint of the chapel would be felt in a greater way in this city. Marriages would be different. Young people would be different. Those who are addicted would be set free. Those who are blind would see. Those who are sick would be healed. Lord, those that need to know that you are not angry at them, your anger was poured on the cross, that it is now the favorable year of the Lord. Use the chapel as a pebble in the pond that is Cleveland to ripple out with those truths. In Jesus' name.